The following podcast is a presentation of Project Entertainment Network. Welcome to Staring into the Abyss. I'm your host, Richard Gerlach. With me, as always, is Michael Patrick Hicks. Hello. Matt Brandenburg. Hey, hey, hey. And a very special guest, the author of Shelter for the Damned, Mike Thorne. Hey, everybody. Thanks for having me. Thank you for coming on. Totally. Thank you for have. Thank you for joining us. <laughs> Today's discussion is going to be about The Black Cat by Edgar Allan Poe which oh, was buddy. chosen by Mike Thorne. And this is going to be a, a pretty fun discussion. I think <laughs> I know Matt's be... Matt's been saving some, some feelings. <laughs> this story, it, it, it's got some interesting stuff in it. Yes. Yes, it does. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. It, yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll talk, but yes, I, I have some theories and some thoughts. Yeah. It's, it's, it's an interesting story to say the least. Not one you think of when you think of Poe, but it's definitely one that once you read it, you can't really unread it again. <laughs> no. <laughs> exactly. I actually often teach it on the first day of class for English composition, okay. and I get looks uh, alternating between terror, confusion, and, and some like pleading looks, like, why are you doing this to us? So <laughs> it's a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that sounds about right. <laughs> Perfect. Do any of um, the students show excitement for <laughs> what may come? You know, there's the odd there's the there's the odd sicko in the group who looks really thrilled and uh, intrigued by the story, and then I'm like, oh, okay, there are there are more of us out there. Yeah, like, this class <laughs> is gonna rock. What else are we reading? <laughs> yeah. yeah, honestly, that's like me too. And whenever I teach, I choose like the first story I taught this year was like "A Sound of Thunder" by Ray Bradbury. Oh, hell yeah. And, and half the kids were just like either horrified or like a few were like, yeah, this is I'm, I'm fucking with this. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Does that story have animal mutilation in it? <laughs> uh, <laughs> it does have a. Well, not really. There is, <laughs> there is a hint that the main character gets shot in the face at the end. So there you go. Nice. <laughs> Poe doesn't do much hinting here, does he? No, no, no. Poe tells us directly what's going on here. Oh, yeah. Man. <laughs> but before we get into Poe, we would just need to give some recommendations of some media we consumed this last week. So after I talked about The Mountainhead last week, I decided to read the one John Lee's comic I haven't read yet, which is called Hotel with two L's. Is this that new one from was AWA Studios? Yeah. Yes. Oh, I I want to read that one. It is really fucking good. It's not as brutal or batshit as John Lee's other stuff. This one's more kind of like it's four separate stories that are interconnected, but they all take place in this hotel on Route 66 that only appears for you if you're someone who's running from something or in pain. And then this hotel kind of feeds off your inner demons. Yeah. I've seen the art previews and the covers look phenomenal. So I, that's on my list. It is a really fine twisted piece of horror. Like the first one is about a pregnant woman who's running from her abusive boyfriend. And every night she has dreams of her unborn baby who is, committing acts of mutilation on her and other people as a baby as well. It's a uh, spoiler alert. It's a monster baby. Oh yeah. Then the second comic is about this husband and wife who kind of hate each other. And they find this like weird colored water, like pond area behind the hotel that they go swimming in. And it makes them like immortal. And All like right. the husband brutally kills the wife cuts her body up and throws it in the suitcase and buries it in the lake. And then he gets back to the hotel and his wife's there. Oh man. 
And Sounds very just, Poe-esque. It yeah. is a little mm-hmm. Poe-esque. And then they kind of have a back and forth, but neither of them can die. Nice. Wow. And then the, the third one is about a girl who's trying to find a serial killer that killed her sister. And the killer was last seen at this hotel. Mm-hmm. And she's trying to find him. Now, is there an overarching narrative to this? Uh, just the innkeeper kind of detailing these stories. Okay. And so they all kind of connect together with the last story. Okay. So it's definitely got like an anthology vibe to it. Yeah. And they're all, they're all happening at the same time, at the same place. Okay. So, so like they see each other? Yeah, they, they bump into each other and stuff. Neat. Nice. What does the ec- the extra L stand for? It doesn't really stand for anything. Okay. <laughs> stands just, for Lucifer, Matt. It's, it's a stylish yes. choice. <laughs> well, um, like, is it like a neon sign outside and like the O and the T are missing, so it says hell? Yeah, a little bit. But the, the, right. the, the, T, the T's partially there. Like, only some of the T's missing. Yeah, it's like Death Spa. And then the last story is about this father who believes his kid is possessed by a demon and this priest who's trying to exercise the demon. And the hotel is bringing up the real demon inside. Neat. So it is it is a fun little four issue like anthology comic that if you're a fan of like. Just horror stories that are a bit more subdued and more focused on characters and their like emotions and their arcs. I would highly recommend this one. Um, uh, the, don't go into it thinking it's one of John Lee's other things, because this one's a lot more subdued than most yeah. of his other work. I mean, it sounds neat. It does. I know. I think AWA is a fairly new comic book company, but they are off to a very promising start. I think Colin Bunn just released a new series through them fairly recently, a Christmas-themed series. Huh. I gotta check that one. I do love me some Colin Bunn. Yeah, he's a good guy. But um, that that's my big recommendation. I have like one more, but I'll save that for the second round. Mike, what about you? Uh, my big one is Twisted Anatomy, a body horror anthology from the review crew at Sci-Fi and Scary. So a little bit of a caveat here is that I am Twitter friends with a fair number of the reviewers for Sci-Fi and Scary including their owner, Lillian George. That said, I think this is a really, really good anthology. Like the Shiver anthology I read a couple weeks ago, it's a big boy with 30 stories, which is a fucking lot of stories for an anthology. For me, anyway. (laughs) Jeez. They are pretty short for the most part. Some of them are like two or three minutes long of Kindle reading time. There's others that are a little bit longer, but still... My main complaint is that, you know, just 30 stories is a lot. And I've now read two anthologies practically back to back that were both 30 stories each. So I am (laughs) taking a long break from anthologies for a while. (laughs) Yeah. This anthology, you get a whole bunch of body horror with it. So you've got parasites and the crazy things they do to people's bodies. You've got uh, extra teeth that are growing in two hollows of the skull and mouth. You have a lot of tentacles. You've got a lot of random extra mouths and you've got a couple killer vaginas. <laughs> nice. Uh, some standouts. We have our previous uh, friend of the abyss guest, Red Lego. She kicks off the anthology with a story called blood bogged, which I think just on sheer volume of blood is probably the bloodiest story that I have ever read. And it's about a woman with an uncontrollable period. <laughs> <laughs> did you, did you fare better with that story, Mike, that, uh, the Sarah Tatenlinger I know did. that we did I together. Did. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I found this one a little bit easier to digest. than uh, <laughs> oh, <dude. laughs> Choice of word. <laughs> you had to go there. I did. <laughs> R.J. Joseph does a really cool story called Witness Bearer, which is about a young woman who her body consumes the people around her and like she ingests their darkest secrets and they appear on her body as an extra pair of eyes. So when the story begins, she's introduced to us as a young woman with a thousand eyes. (laughs) 
and it's a badass premise. It is a freaking great short story. It's one of those stories that I want to see expanded into a novella or even a full length novel, because I think there is so much potential and room to grow in this story that Joseph could do some really, really cool things with this story and its premise. Since it's body horror, we get some great Cronenberg-like visuals with some of these stories. Uh, Justin Moritz does a story called Claustrophobia Americana, which is about twins, but a very unusual take on twin births. It really crawls under your skin a little bit with that one. (laughs) (laughs) And then you get some really fun bizarro romps. Byron Alexander Campbell does a story about a small town that's haunted by foreskin. (laughs) (laughs) It starts off with these guys that have been circumcised. Their foreskin just randomly grows back. But it also has a life of its own. And (laughs) the first victim we see has been hung by his own foreskin and strangled (laughs) to death. And then the foreskin just ends up taking over everything. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> so it's not like like a little piece of foreskin crawling around. It's like. Oh, no. OK. No, it's it's mutant killer foreskin. <laughs> All right. <laughs> That's the best brutal. kind. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Lillian George, uh, founder of Sci-Fi and Scary, like I said earlier, contributes with her own story that reminded me a little bit of Species which is, for me, a classic fucking horror flick. (laughs) Yeah. In this one, uh, George's, I I guess, heroine, sleeps with an astronaut who was freshly returned from a voyage to outer space, and her body undergoes a few changes, and her any parts get a little outy, and (laughs) she finds out that her vagina is a killer creature now. (laughs) (laughs) Amazing. (laughs) And following on a similar theme is Haley Piper, who writes a really, really fun short story that's in the style of a self-help manual to help these post-apocalyptic readers whose souls have become tethered to an infernal vagina monster. (laughs) (laughs) And that one is just an absolute blast. Um, (laughs) Of course, 30 stories, not all of them are going to be great. There were a few that didn't quite work for me. But on the whole, this anthology is an absolute blast. I'm a big fan of body horror. So having a whole anthology devoted to that topic is a whole lot of fun for me. (laughs) And I kind of have the same tastes as a lot of the sci-fi and scary crew. So having them put together this body horror anthology is kind of a no-brainer for me, and I wound up enjoying quite a lot of it. And that was my week in reading. <laughs> nice. That sounds um, pretty awesome. What about yep. you, Matt? So I will. I finished uh, the latest Vestarian, which Mike, I read your story to Primer, and it was amazing. Oh, thank you so much. No problem. It definitely stuck out. You know, it it feels very Legadian, which makes sense because of Vestarian. But, um, yeah, I had a lot of fun with that, especially the end. Much appreciated. Yeah, that was uh, <laughs> that was like my uh, just straight up depression and anxiety horror story. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, and, and I like I like the concept of the cure and, and how that helps this uh, helps him at the end. <laughs> yeah <laughs> whether or not it actually helps is uh <laughs> right. debatable, but yeah you know he didn't he, he was fine with everything at that point <laughs> <laughs> exactly yes uh, so yes um I, I think i talked a lot about vestarian last week um but it again it's a great great literary journal you should sign up for it i did start and i'm about halfway through alien cold forge which oh, Mike, yeah i yeah. think you read that very good. Um, I am. I'm ready. He's got another one coming out in just a couple weeks. Uh, oh, he into, does. Yeah, I think it's called Into Carabidia, something like that. And I've got that on pre-order for a long, long time. I've been waiting for that <laughs> one for a while. Uh, continue. Let's hear it. <laughs> no problem. Yes, it, I really like this, and I think you even said in your because I, I read your review as I was I was looking at it, and you hate everybody in this story. <laughs> 
there is not one good person. They are all so basic concept. This cold forge is a uh, like satellite space station in which they're doing different science experiments. And one of them obviously revolves around the aliens. And you have a character who has a, a very rare disease, which she is going to die from. And she's hoping that she can get the cure from the aliens. But then this auditor comes and he is there to kind of shut the place down slash fire anybody who is costing the company money. And uh, then, of course, because it's an alien book, the aliens get loose and chaos ensues. But (laughs) throughout all of this, none of the characters are – they're all compelling, but you dislike all of them. There's not one one hope – like, you know, one good person in this group that you're like, yeah, I really hope they make it. The The auditor is a terrible person who oh, he is the worst <laughs> of the bunch. <laughs> you absolutely hate him. He does everything he can. He thinks he's all powerful and he, yeah, uses people to find out information, which then in turn he'll fire them. But he won't even fire them in person. He'll fire them as he's leaving the station, whatever station he's on in an email, basically. And then our um, scientist Blue with the rare disease, you think she's kind of your um, your heroine, but at the same time, she doesn't care about anybody on the station. She's willing to screw them all over to find this cure. And so she, she like, I finished her, her science, par- her partner was trying something that she suggested in which turned he got his face all ripped off and 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 she basically doesn't really she's like well you should have done it better um so but it's compelling enough like you know reading sometimes when you read stuff that you hate everybody and you're kind of like man why am i reading this but it's compelling enough that you are you're fully on board for it and you're interested to see what's going to happen next and It's definitely a good example of how to write despicable characters, yet still have your reader invest it. You know, I'm invested in all of them. I mean, obviously, the auditor, I hope, dies, and I don't know because I haven't finished it. But he's still compelling enough that you're, like, interested because you go – the camera kind of shoots between him and – Blue, and then every once in a while I'll do, like, a little interlude, which is kind of fun. But – um. Yeah, you're still intrigued by him. You're like, what's this guy's deal? And then that's the same for Blue. As much as you're kind of mad at what she's doing and how she's going about doing this, you're still hoping that she figures out what to do and that this will cure her disease. Because she she sort of has an idea of like passing this along to the rest of humanity, though part of her thoughts are the book deals and talking about it and all this stuff, too. So. But yeah, if if you're interested in how to write despicable characters, it's definitely a good example <laughs> to, to, of something to look at. So yeah, that that's most of my week. I am continuing my bad karate ninja 1980s, 1990s movies. I've been doing that for the last couple of weeks, and, and that's been entertaining. But we don't need to go in details of that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And anything on your end, Mike? Yeah, as you guys were talking, I was thinking, oh, I should talk about things I've read because I've been watching so many films lately. I recently read uh, my first Joanna Koch book. Is it Koch or Coach? Do you guys know? That's a good question. No. Yeah. I don't know either. Okay, Joanna Koch, uh, The Wingspan of Severed Hands, which is a fairly new release from Weird Punk Books. It's a really difficult book to describe in terms of plot, (laughs) but I I immediately was drawn to uh, their prose style um, and the way they write these kinds of slippages between consciousness. It has like this kind of hallucinatory psychic quality, but it also has um, some of those Cronenberg-esque body horror elements that uh, Mike was talking about enjoying in uh, that recent sci-fi and scary anthology. So, yeah, just in terms of <clears throat> their prose style, highly recommend that book. Nice. And I just the other day finished reading John Ferris's uh, The Axeman Cometh, which is I think it was late 80s. Have any of you read this one? No, but it sounds like an amazing title. <laughs> that title is amazing. 
that's why I bought it. I bought it for the <laughs> title and the uh, late 80s cover art, which is this bloodstained axe below the bold capital uh, capitalized lettering. Yeah, it, it, actually, it's an interesting book. In the introduction, John Ferris has this author's note where he insists that the reader uh, devour it all in one sitting, which unfortunately I did not do. I guess I'm a bad <laughs> I'm a bad reader, but um, <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a lot of fun. It's uh, it seems to be going in one direction uh, at the beginning that it's going to be a fairly conventional uh, slasher thriller sort of thing, but in the final third, it delves into this bizarre, surreal territory that involves the the kind of resurrected ghost of Ernest Hemingway. And you don't know if <laughs> he's a figment of the protagonist's imagination or if Hemingway has just decided to, like, come along for this crazy uh, supernatural adventure. So that was fun. <laughs> yeah. I've been watching lots of movies recently. I've been watching some Craven for another podcast interview I'm doing soon. Um, I revisited The Hills Have Eyes and Last House on the Left. Nice. And yeah, classics. And I, I just saw Deadly Blessing for the first time, which I think is uh, probably one of his most underappreciated works. Huh. I don't know if I've heard of that one. Yeah, it's always kind of slipped under the radar. It's like I've, I've, I've read a few people describe it as a kind of um, bridge between the early Craven, that kind of brutal, um, realist, quasi-realist style of Last House and Hills Have Eyes toward, you know, the more kind of elegant surrealism of things like Nightmare on Elm Street and Shocker and things like that. So this film kind of like dips its toes in both of those worlds. It's awesome. really slow. It's really slow, but it's it's um yeah, it's worth the wait. Nice. I'll have to check those out. Thankfully for Mike, I have no movies or anything to recommend this week. <laughs> wait, <laughs> did you did you watch the latest WandaVision? I did watch the latest WandaVision. That was I like that one. Mike, did you watch that? I did. What'd you think? I liked it. I am I'm really getting intrigued as to where they're taking all of this. Seriously. Yeah. I yeah. I, I enjoyed it. I'm enjoying the weirdness of it a lot. Um, a lot of people are still complaining about that show, but I'm I'm really enjoying it. It's something different and something that like it's not your typical Marvel experience yet. No. I feel it's going to become that, but right now it's something unique. Yeah, I, it's building. It's going to become, I think, a pretty regular Marvel kind of story. But I'm enjoying it for what it is right now, and I'm. it has my interest, it has my attention, and it has sparked a lot of curiosity in me as to what they're going to do with this. Yeah, well, and I kind of the go off of what I was talking about last week, this definitely um, – gives you more of what's happening kind of outside of this world that Wanda possibly created. I have no idea if that's true or not, but you at least at the end there, you get to see a little bit more, which is it kind of exactly what I was talking about for that first episode. You don't know what's happening, but you know that something is happening um, outside of what we're seeing on, you know, in this, whatever it is, if it's her, if it's her mind or if it's like this weird trap that they made for her. So I, and it's an it, yeah, it's enough that you're intrigued, but you're still um, not sure what's happening. So I enjoyed it. I really enjoyed it too. So we'll see where it, where it goes. I also kind of gave up on the stand. I've been watching that, but I forgot that was still happening. I'm not I'm not enjoying what they're doing with it. So I I kind of stopped for now, but I might go back to it. Um, Are they sticking like really with that halfway through kind of thing that they were doing? In the first episode, I guess. Yeah, and they also go off the plot, and they just do something completely different than what's in the book. And, like, I'm cool with shows doing their own things, but at the same time, it's like, this is the stand. Yeah. Whatever they're trying to do isn't working, but you can tell they have, like, an idea, and hmm. it just doesn't work for me. The characters aren't as compelling as they should be. The actors are doing an okay job. Like The actors are pretty good. But I'm just not finding anything compelling. Yeah, that's making me want to watch it. Well, and it's interesting because it's such a big book to go off the to like veer into a different territory. I, like I get that for shorter stuff because you're kind of like, oh, I want to expand or you know expand a certain thing or help show something else. But the, it's you know it's so ginormous that you don't need to expand anywhere else. Just 
you go with that, you know? So that's weird. Yeah. I mean, we'll, we'll see where it goes, but I, for now I'm taking a pause on that, but I did read something that we typically don't talk about. And that is a horror poetry collection. Oh, okay. I have read a uh, Whitechapel Rhapsody by Alessandro Manzetti, Terrific. which is a series of poems inspired by Jack the Ripper. Oh. I just read that recently too. Oh. It's it's really good. It is good. Like <laughs> I've only read Alessandro's stuff, but he's co-written with like Bruce Boston and other people. So this is my first like just him writing by himself. And I was the imagery was really sharp. Like. He had he did a great job setting the mood. He did a great job with kind of like the narrative voice of all the poems being connected to Whitechapel and its connection to Jack the Ripper and kind of the idea of Whitechapel being this place that breeds people like Jack <laughs> as they go through everything. It's it's a really powerful collection of poems. Um, but that's it for me. If you guys have anything else. Uh, nope. So. Before we dive into The Black Cat with Mike, well, by the time this podcast is aired, Mike Thorne's new book is going to be out. So why don't you tell our audience a little bit about your book? Sure, yeah. Um, it, this is my debut novel. Uh, the title is Shelter for the Damned. Um, it's coming out through Journal Stone on February 26th. So yeah, by the time this drops, it will probably have been released. It's a It's a kind of twisted coming of age story um, that focuses on a troubled uh, teenager named Mark who stumbles across um, this mysterious shack in a suburban field uh, with two of his friends, uh, Scott and Adam. They're looking around for a place to smoke cigarettes without being uh, bothered by uh, nosy adults. So they go (laughs) into the shack and um, Scott and Adam quickly kind of lose interest in this place. They, they're just like, why would we want to hang out in this dingy, weird structure? We don't know where it came from. We don't know what it is. But Mark develops um, an intense fixation on it. Um, and early in the novel, you learn that Mark has issues. He has a kind of uh, violent ideation and um, he feels isolated. He feels alienated. He doesn't feel like a part of uh, normalized social structures. So the shack becomes a kind of sanctuary for him. But as the novel progresses, he learns that the shack has this kind of weird sentience and it starts asking for things in return for the sanctuary it provides. And <clears throat> the novel descends into quasi cosmic slash hallucinatory pure horror, I guess you would say, (laughs) Um, heavily inspired by Poe and Lovecraft in equal measures, but also by, I guess you could say these writers are students of Poe, although they're not, you wouldn't classify them as horror writers proper, Um, Hubert Selby Jr. and Jim Thompson, and of course, Stephen King as well. I mean, I feel like it almost goes without saying now, Stephen King is just like the air we breathe. (laughs) Um, (laughs) But uh, yeah, so that's that's um, that's Shelter for the Damned, and I'm really excited to unleash it on the world. Very cool. Yeah, awesome. that sounds awesome. <laughs> I like that you brought up Herbert Selvig Jr. That so so it's going to be dark. It's very dark. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. Hubert Selvig Jr. I think has inspired me as much as as anyone. Um, I remember I discovered his work in my late teens, and the way he writes addiction and obsession, particularly. Um, had a big impact on this novel. And actually, earlier drafts of Shelter for the Damned, I, I kind of aped Selby's style. So I wrote it without any punctuation, just <laughs> commas and slashes. And then I had a, uh, a uh, wise writing mentor say, why did you write it this way? And I was like, well, I, I, I love Hubert Selby Jr. And he was like, maybe you should just just uh, write it conventionally. Like I don't. <laughs> so uh, I think that was good advice. <laughs> I'm a, I'm a big Selby Jr. fan myself, so I, I totally understand that. <laughs> Hell yeah. Which which ones uh, have stood out to you? Honestly, for me, it's always going to be Last Exit to Brooklyn because yeah. that was just the first book I read from him. And it's just always kind of stuck in my mind. It's devastating. Yeah. It's one of the bleakest but most honest books I think I've ever read. Yes. 
I still I still revisit that book like once a year just because I don't know something just compels me to like constantly read that read that book over and over again. Yeah, yeah, the prose is so alive it just like yanks you along. It really does. Yeah. Oh man, yeah, I read and I'm totally drawing a blank. What was the one that uh, Aronofsky made the movie of? Requiem for a Dream. Um, yes, Requiem for a Dream. Man, that one was so hard to get through because it just like. Oh, just it hurts. <laughs> yes. Just yeah. all that addiction and, and eating and drugs and everything. And I was just like, oh, man, it's super depressing. I needed light days to read it. Otherwise, I'd be very in a dark place. <laughs> <laughs> it's heavy. Yeah. <laughs> oh, but no, that sounds awesome. So end of February. All right. So then we'll keep our eyes out for that book. Yeah. When I was talking to you about choosing a story for today's podcast, your first thing was like the Black Cat by Edgar Allan Poe, which <laughs> isn't really a story that people typically pick when they think of like Poe. So what draws you to the Black Cat? I think it's uh, I mean, it draws me to um, a lot of these writers that I was just talking about who are inspired by Poe. And I would also add Stephen King to that list, you know, particularly The Shining. I think Two of the main ideas I tend to return to both as a reader and as a writer are addiction and obsession and the way these two ideas can intertwine with each other or merge in a strange way. And I think Black Cat to me is just like the greatest horror story about addiction and obsession. And it's just like it's lean and mean and absolutely terrifying and disturbing. And I like that Poe aligns the reader in a really uncomfortable way with this disturbed protagonist, which is also something that tends to interest me both as a reader and as a writer. I love the way that he sort of like toes us into that because he talks about, you know, like you kind of hear about him as a child and and then he gets married and he has this, you know, nice wife and everything. And then he he has that cat Paris or Pluto. Pluto. Yeah. Pluto. I don't know why P both P's. And then he's like, well, then I started to turn or something. Start Like he doesn't even talk about like like eventually you get that he's hanging out at bars and he's drinking a lot. But like that first like turn and when he started to despise Pluto, it's so like it, that whatever that paragraph was, it's like the second page of it. You're kind of just like, I wonder what happened. Like you don't know. It could be anything. I mean, and then it turns into him drinking. But at that point, you're like, well, is it the cat? Did a cat make him feel this like angry and hate animals and everything? Or was it something else? So it's such like a neat way to to make it happen without you like to kind of just ease you into this like this drunk. (laughs) Yeah, totally. And I think the way Poe does that is also um, very much aligning with the gothic tradition in terms of kind of leveling an assault against enlightenment values that kind of valorize like human reason and human faculties and human progress. And Poe just kind of completely, I like to use the phrase humiliates the human, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. It's a very like renegade story in that way. <laughs> yeah. I think, I think one, there's a couple big questions in this <laughs> um and I, I i think the first one is he gets a pet monkey <laughs> did you guys catch that yeah mm-hmm. I, I just was like his wife get gets him all these pets and it's like a bird and it's like a dog and then and then it says uh a monkey it, <laughs> i was like what is this all about did people get pet monkeys a lot back then I mean, everybody in the 1800s had a pet monkey. I'm surprised you didn't know that. <laughs> Apparently, everybody. I missed that. <laughs> Literally everybody. <laughs> it, was pretty, it was quite common. Yeah, Melville, was, Dickens, everybody. Yeah. Did they really all have monkeys? I don't know. No. I don't. <laughs> I like, Wait a minute. Are you guys messing with me? I mean, but Poe writes a very scary orangutan that he writes as Orang Utan in the story The Murders in the Rue Morgue. So Yes. Yeah. Well, And that's what... That was going to be my next bigger discussion. Like the monkey is one thing. I thought that was just kind of a funny like ad to just be like he has a monkey. And then you only see that monkey one other time and it's like a split second. 
Well, I guess I'll, I'll step into that question. I mean, for for anyone who hasn't read this, it basically our narrator is telling his story from a jail cell. They we get that right from the start, and which is kind of like classic Poe. Yeah, and and he is. It's almost a confession. It's almost like I need to tell you all this terrible thing that happened, and and you might not believe in ghosts or spirits or whatever, but this. I'm telling you as it as it happened to me and then yeah you get into he he loved animals he had a hard time with humans but he always loved he had a dog, pet dog that he loved and then he gets married uh he apparently he's rich I don't know if they say what he does but he did something and he has lots of money and so he gets all these pets and he gets in a black- fact it was a symbol of status back then for rich people to have monkeys <laughs> <laughs> they That's just, how you could tell they had that they were elite. They they would just the monkey would walk with them to their meetings and then yeah. they would just sit there and exactly and if they'd, they'd perch on his shoulder. Little, if they didn't <laughs> like somebody's response, they would fling poo at him. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, poor people couldn't afford a monkey, so just, Rockefeller had a monkey. <laughs> I feel like there there is a story there for the guy and his monkey. So then I can't remember if the cat the cat doesn't show up. She his wife gets him the cat, right? That first one, not the Pluto? second cat. Yes. I guess I could look in the book, but he gets I don't a cat. Call offhand. Yeah. So he gets his cat and it's a black cat and then like I said he something happens his his, his mood changes and he starts to hate this cat and hate Almost everybody. Um, he hates all of his pets, um, but specifically the cat. And then, and we'll talk about it in a second. He does something, and the cat, more things happen. Then the cat goes away, their house burns down, and then they get another cat, and then more bad stuff happens. <laughs> I do love how in my copy, when he's listing all of the animals he has, like the cat is italicized. Like this is the most outrageous animal they own <laughs> not the monkey important. the cat yeah it's like we had birds goldfish a fine dog rabbits a small monkey and a cat <laughs> <laughs> oh. it's a very exotic feline yeah <laughs> because nobody back then had cats it no, was they all had dogs monkeys. and monkeys <laughs> and goldfish maybe the occasional zebra yeah maybe <laughs> a couple porcupines yeah, i could see that a skunk the cat was happen to uh, really show their status. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, back in the 1800s, like people like the Tiger King were more common than not. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. One day he'll get his pardon. It's basically <laughs> Dr. Doolittle goes to hell. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We, like we get this good setup of he he loves his wife. He loves his animals. And then when this Does chain. You know? Well, he does until whatever this change, the, his mood changes. And then, yeah, he hates this cat so much that he pries one of the cat's eyes out. Yeah. Yep. I mean, for me coming into this story, right on the heels of Twisted Anatomy is kind of funny. On Twitter, Lillian was tweeting about the Twisted Anatomy anthology coming out and how about the a few of the women in the anthology had written some of the grossest stories she had ever read. And a male respondent had to mansplain to her, like, well, why do they have to go for gross? Why can't they be more intellectual and write things that would stand the test of time like Poe? <laughs> <laughs> and then it's like, OK, you get into like the 1800s version of Splatterpunk with this one, like in the first <laughs> couple pages this guy's cutting the eyes out of a cat <laughs> he hangs it from a tree then he hangs it from a tree yeah then he's drinking yeah. he's gets another cat who he thinks is like some possessed demon yeah. so he's gonna try and kill that cat but his wife stops him so he kills her instead buries <laughs> <laughs> yeah. the axe in her brain poe writes yeah. <laughs> yep. and then he's got to figure out okay well gosh should i just throw her corpse in the lake should i dismember her should i burn her like, <laughs> what are my options? How, how should I go about this? Yeah. <laughs> so for me, it was funny coming into the story after a Twitter <laughs> man was like, you need to write more quaint horror. Like this would never 
these authors <laughs> back then didn't unleash a drop of blood and were still able to scare you. I was like, motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> this person has definitely not read Edgar Allan Poe. <laughs> yeah. Who <laughs> stopped paid attention to Edgar Allan Poe? <laughs> yeah. Let me tell you about the black cat, bitch, because. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my gosh! Yeah, he. So I did flip through it. He calls it. He says our friendship lasted in this manner for several years, during which my general temperament and character, through the instrumentality of the fiend intemperance, had I blush to confess it, experienced a radical alteration for the worse. So maybe not his mood, but his feed intemperance. Um, so fiend. alcohol. Yeah. <laughs> then it jumps <laughs> into him being intoxicated and. And and being mad at the cat, and that's when he pulls the eyeball out. Yeah, <laughs> it's an interesting case of unreliable narration, though, isn't it? Like that's part yeah. of what I talk to my students about: is how much can we trust this guy's account when he's like sloshed out of his mind for you know? And this yeah. is also a guy who pried his cat's eyeball out of its socket. It's like how much <laughs> do we want to take his word? Yeah, um, <laughs> exactly. And then supposedly hung it from a tree, and then. It apparently disappeared after that. <laughs> yes. Yes. Well, and, and I think that's a good point about the unreliable narrator because you he sets up – Poe sets it up. Again, at the beginning, he's writing that this is all a letter. is like his experience. And he um, – and even throughout it, you kind of get these little like – like he kind of steps away from the current story and, and is like tell, – as he's telling you. And, and it's all of these things where he's trying to act like he, like he knows it was a bad deed and he's like, I just don't know what came over me or he's like, it mm-hmm. it was the horror. So like, I think that which just adds to it because you're kind of in the mindset of like, oh, he recognizes that this was all bad, but it's because the, this, these things are demons and or it, it wasn't it's not his fault. He was drunk. It's this fiend like he picked up this, this, this fiend and temperance and, and, um, it was all the absinthe. It's yeah. the damn alcohol tempting him. It's not his fault. The alcohol made him do it. So it's it, an evil seductress, that alcohol. <laughs> it's interesting too, though, that he names the cat after the Roman God of the underworld, you know? So there's like, yeah. the story signals to you too, that it's possible. This could be, a supernatural influence. And that's what made me think of the influence on something like King's The Shining or some of Jim Thompson's work, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, especially then with the second cat, I mean, that's when you're starting to get into kind of like the demon kind of evil supernatural kind of thing happening because it's just this like the cat, like he, he, the, he has a white spot, this new cat. Cause they thought it looked just like Pluto. Um, Cause it's all black, but then it had this white, spot on its chest that slowly turned into the gallows and or even i was trying to like get this so he um the house burned after he hangs the cat uh he goes to sleep and then his house is on fire and when he comes back the next day there's just one wall standing and there was a was it the cat or was it an image of the cat that was on the wall it's an image it's like an imprint yeah because he describes it and then he's like, well, like it, it could have been somebody had taken the cat or the cat was still alive and had caught itself up on the wall and all this stuff. So <laughs> it was, again, kind of going with the unreliable narrator and the supernatural of this evil cat that is coming back. Yeah, but that's yeah. one of the wildest sequences in the novel or in the story, excuse me, because like there's also this there's a crowd of spectators. And according to him, they're all noting this kind of portrait of the cat on that one standing wall as well. So it, it further tests uh, the limits of what, what can be trusted in the, the protagonist's um, account and, um, you know, what's real and what isn't. Yeah. It could just yeah. be part of his obsession and derangement. Yes. Yeah. Cause, cause here he was like, he, he, he was wondering if it was the cat and he's talking about like, well, the wall is freshly spread plaster and the lime could have mixed with the flames and the ammonia from the carcass. And that's how the portrait. So he like, <laughs> he's going really detailed. Stretch. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> he's some, some mental CSI. gymnastics there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it's just, 
so wacky. And then, like, yeah, he goes into the poor – like, they go into the poor house and – because apparently all of his money was in his house, at, which is an interesting. Like, he didn't – did he not have a bank? I don't know. <laughs> I guess but, the monkey died. Yeah. I mean, I guess all the other pets died. Mm. He doesn't talk about having them all. The monkey uh, – there's there's some backstory for the monkey and the mortar – murders in the room morgue. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I'm um, trying to remember. I was it Larry? Was it John Langan? Somebody had wrote a, a different version of that where Clive Barker. Yes, it was Clive Barker. You're right. There it is. Yes, where the monkey like he tried to make it more human, and then it was like sleeping with people. Um, so okay. anyway, yeah, that's that a different amazing. Time. <laughs> yeah, it, 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 it's really it was really crazy. <laughs> Leave it to Barker. Yeah. Yep. There's uh, a passage in the story that really stands out to me that kind of it just builds off what Mike was just saying about the protagonist derangement. I wonder when he talks about the spirit of perverseness. Do you guys remember this passage? Yes. Yes. Yeah. He says, who has not a hundred times found himself committing a vile or a silly action for no other reason then because, because he knows you should not. Yeah, he knows you're you're not supposed to, and that's why you do it. And yeah. there's a kind of terrifying truth in that. Yeah, we have all these laws. We break them just because we can, because we want to, just to push those limits. Yeah. Why not cut out a cat's eye? Which, again, is so anti-enlightenment. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> why not hit your wife in the head with a cleaver? Yeah. Yes. Barrier in the wall. Who gives a shit? Just because you're not supposed to doesn't mean you can't. <laughs> well, it, it, and yeah, it's funny because he talks about I can't remember if it was when he was hanging the cat or if it was the later one, because he was like, well, I was crying while I was doing it because I knew I shouldn't be doing it. So it's like a serial killer story almost. Yeah. Um, He's kind of pushing those boundaries of back then that school of thought of uh, like the natural state of man. Versus civilization. Yeah, there's there's an interesting uh, set of ideas in this, too. I think one of the other things that interests me about this story is I'm often thinking about human and non-human animal relations and the way, again, this this uh, idea of um, the Vitruvian man at the center of the Renaissance as the ideal. And this protagonist is completely fucked over and destroyed by this animal, you know, or yeah. that's the way he perceives it to happen anyway. It's the animal's fault. There's no way it can be him. No, yeah. no, of course not. It's not the booze. <laughs> it's not the booze. <laughs> it's not the booze. The booze well, makes him happy. Uh, I mean, especially the second cat, because it was he, just one drink. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think that's a good point because he gets the second cat at the bar and it like it because it follows him. It follows him from the bar to his house and then it follows him around. But then, you know, talking about like the dread and kind of the supernatural aspect of everything, it, it this cat like sits on his lap and sleeps on his face, basically, which are all things cats normally do. But in this guy's mind, it's just an evil cat. <laughs> <laughs> That's a really good point, though, that Poe signals to us that that the cat is sitting on this hog's head of gin because it's directly uh, it's kind of visualizing the um, connection between obsession and addiction that the cat, you know, might actually just be a cipher or metaphor for his addiction and the way it's destroying him. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, and which then, you know, you can yeah tie that into the fact that at first he likes this new cat and his wife likes it, too. And that could be, you know, that initial step into alcoholism. I'm enjoying enjoying the drinks. And, and then slowly he dislikes this cat. And that, again, can tie into like you have to drink and you have to do these things. And it's uh, you're not even enjoying it as much as you did before. So, yeah, that's uh, it's pretty deep. Definitely. Yeah. No. And I think, again, that's that's a big part of where I can see the influence on uh, Selby and Thompson, the way they write about addiction. It's like it goes back to Poe for sure, I think. Yeah, definitely. But yeah, he uh, <laughs> so well. And the other interesting thing, well, is that like so he has this wife who barely gets mentioned and the, a couple times that she, he, she they mention the wife, Poe mentions this, is like, 
he at first he likes her a lot, but then she has to deal with all of his aggression that and the pets he kind of lumps them together and then it you know it that that's kind of see i mean like that's stepping us into the end of the story because she likes the new cat and then he even talks about like how she doesn't complain by the fact that he's causing all this pain to her as well it's kind of an you know i mean like and and we've talked about this on other podcasts about like kind of these early views like so this is one I'm wondering if somebody out there has already written a story from the wife's point of view because it or even the monkeys, because it's an, it's an interesting <laughs> side of this of like dealing with alcoholism and and dealing in the 1800s. I mean, again, we've we talked about like that kind of where that is, where men are in that kind of society and where women kind of have to be in that society, which then leads us to the end, which is that she is following him to the basement because they're doing he just says a household errand he doesn't even say what it is and the cat causes him to trip which then he pisses him off which means he's going to try to hack the cat up in front of her and the cat moves and he hits his wife in the head with the axe and kills her well she stops him from killing the cat oh that's that, right she likes mm-hmm. the cat she gets in the way and stops him so he that, kills her instead yeah that yeah. pisses him off even more than yes he axes her which is then i think that's like the you know that's the crux of this is he kills his wife and then that he's got to figure out what to do and he comes up with all these crazy ideas and then eventually he's like oh well they had this chimney here i just put some plaster up and bury her in there um, and then when the police show up he has this crazy again it's like a a spirit of perverseness taking hold again when he's like isn't this wall extremely well built what a wall (laughs) let me smack it with my cane to show you how well constructed this is such a strange passage it's definitely not gonna break when i kick it (laughs) because he was gonna get scot free they they were getting ready to leave they were halfway up the steps and he's like look at this i'm like what are you doing (laughs) I think it's just like that spirit of self-destruction that the protagonist has. He might not even be conscious of it, you know, but like yeah. he wants to destroy himself sort of. Well, and it's interesting, too, because like he talks about at, which we don't really like I was trying to figure out because he talks about after the wife is dead that there's like three or four days where people are kind of commenting on it, which, again, I think is interesting in this story because we don't. You don't know, like, wh- why are they commenting on it? Like, because I, I guess his wife is out and about, and now that she's not. Yeah, well, we like, don't get any idea of what kind of reputation he has. Yeah. Like, so th- we're very internalized with his own thoughts. We don't know what his standing is in this neighborhood or how other people see him. Yeah. If they have caught him being violent before, it's like, oh shit, his yeah. wife's gone, and yeah, that's not a good sign. No, better get the constable. Seem, yeah, the police don't seem to suspect him of anything. No, and and, and exactly like because I mean that's it. Like there's he he talks. He's like, well, there's a couple days where people are 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 talking about it, and then he's like, and then it's the fourth day that the cops come, and yeah, like you said, it's just sort of like a routine check. We're just gonna check your house just to see. And then, yeah, that's when he, he takes him down to the basement and self-destructs a little bit. Yeah. And then look at my it, new wall. <laughs> 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 look how sturdy this building is. <laughs> I'm so glad you randomly showed up here, policeman. Let's go downstairs <laughs> yes. where I definitely did not this. bury my wife. <laughs> <laughs> Which then, and then it it's, he's like, well, then it's a moan and a cry. And then that's when they break open the wall and they discover that the wife is cl- clearly dead. And the cat was back there too. I have buried that infernal beast in the chimney by accident. <laughs> Oops. Oops. We weren't supposed to see that. Yeah. My bad y'all. <laughs> right. Well, I love and it's, that ending. Yeah. <laughs> it, 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 it's this crazy – he talks about this scream, and the way he describes it, it's very human. You know, He says it's like a sobbing of a child, and then, then there's this half-shriek, half-horror, triumphant thing, which is I, I, is really interesting and makes you – like because then that, that kind of twists a little bit more with the cat because I've heard cats howl and, and, and make those noises. They don't sound human. So like in this case, you know – it, it 
is he pointing at the cat truly being like a demonic, evil, supernatural cat? Because for a second when I was reading that, I was like, oh, well, maybe the maybe the axe didn't like fully get in there. And, and she's just <laughs> she like was just knocked out. But then they he describes it as like clearly she's decomposed. Yeah. Um, it's just yeah. a mere flesh wound. <laughs> so so I cover. Yeah. So it's an interesting like, you know, question of is this cat tr- truly d- demonic or or did the whales just sound human to him? And to the cops, did they just think, oh, there's something back there. Let's go find out. Yeah, I think that's the question. I mean, when I assign this story on my first day of English composition, what I usually <laughs> do is I I have half the students uh, comb through the story and find evidence that the protagonist is telling the truth. And then half the class uh, is supposed to find evidence that he is an unreliable narrator. I think that that side has an easier task set out for them. Um, <laughs> but yeah, there, there, you know, there is one reading of the story that this um, this cat is a supernatural presence or demonic presence or something. Yeah, because yeah. like they both comment on the fact that this new cat is all black except for the little white spot. But we don't see the wife commenting on it being the shape of a gallows. Which, you know, is exactly your point. Is he unreliable? And is he seeing this? Like, is that his guilt for killing the first cat slash all of his other abuse? Like, so is that internal or is that like the cat truly demonic? So I think, you know, that's a really good, a good uh, thing to like look through and a good uh, discussion for people. So it makes for an interesting first day of class. (laughs) (laughs) The other thing I kind of want, and this is to step out of the black cat, but to look at say Poe's stories. And that is, this feels like a couple of his other stories, almost like a best of because I, Rich, you had talked about like, obviously like telltale heart, which the came other out one, the same year as, as the black cat. Uh, yeah. And, and then the other one I was thinking of, and I cannot pronounce that. Like the last cast of, of Amontillado. Yes. That one in which mm. they bury people behind the wall. So mm. like, you know, and, and we've talked about this for other other writers. I feel like Stephen King is maybe the the biggest. I don't want to say culprit, but the biggest one who you can tell he's rewritten. So, like he writes a story and then decides, hey, I can make this better and writes it again. And yeah, so, <laughs> I feel that's not an uncommon thing for writers. You know, we have certain elements, certain story elements, and themes and topics we like to return to time and time again. It's kind of like, oh, well, I hated how I did it the first time around. I think I can really do it better this time with this yeah. element. Okay. Definitely. Yeah. Well, yeah. Man. And I, oh, sorry. Oh, you, you go, Mike. <laughs> oh, I was just going to say, I think sometimes it's unconscious too. You know, like yeah. I, I find sometimes it takes me years looking back at something to realize, oh, I was, you know, revisiting a certain set of ideas again or whatever. It's usually not the, at the top of my mind when I'm writing. And I, I think that's probably true for a lot of writers. Yeah. I also huh. think this is a common theme for Poe where he likes to write about the idea of death, having more control over the people than people kind of have control of. Yes. So the idea that like with a telltale heart and with the story, the narrators and both stories have essentially gotten away with the perfect crime. But the effects of killing somebody comes back to make them either one reveal their guilt or to do one thing that reveals to the police that, oh, no, they actually did this terrible act. Yeah, Yeah. that's a good point. Like, I get that part. But like, were a lot of people getting buried behind walls at that time? (laughs) Because like, like that is something that I was wondering also, <laughs> like, I don't know how much of that was a reasonable attempt to cover up crimes back then. But I think it does play with the element of funeral rights. Yes. When you look at death back then, you know, they didn't have funeral homes. People would host the death reception in their house. Like you would go into the living room and there's the casket and there's the dead body right in our own home for days on end until we're done with mourning and can bury them. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And in terms of the cask of Amontillado, I mean, 
apparently I, I watched recently a biography on Poe and apparently it was much less uncommon in the 19th century for people to accidentally be buried alive. So it was a much, <laughs> right. it was, they, they didn't have, I guess, the same thorough processes of checking. <laughs> right. so, it was a less like outlandish fear in a way. So that yeah. could be part of what he's building on too. Yeah. So you're pouring a foundation, Jimmy accidentally falls in. It's like, well, we don't know what happened to him. We, <laughs> Oh, shit. Rest in peace, Jimmy. <laughs> yeah. I took a smoke break. He came. I came back. He was gone. Fucker. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> guess we're not paying him. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I yeah. guess each of us gets an extra dollar today. We'll just divvy up his cup. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Oh, my gosh. But, yeah. Putting that's up a brick wall. I don't know what happened. <laughs> Just like, like I, yeah, I was just wondering because I felt like, but that that all makes sense because it just felt like, like we had, he had done those almost exact topics before. I mean, it's a different story, but just a concept of like putting somebody behind a wall like that. It just, I was like, oh, that's interesting. He's kind of touching back on some stuff he's, he's done or will be doing. I can't remember the timeline of all those stories. The other thing, which we, we've we already hit multiple times, but just talking about inspirations, I mean, this one specifically, you could see so much of where, like, how he inspired H.P. Lovecraft. I mean, like, mm-hmm. th- there's a whole big section about dread and, and this kind of the narrator telling this story that's kind of half true. Even the fact that it's kind of a letter, I really like that. I think it's it's an interesting to always kind of look back at those kind of the in who's inspired who and, and read those ones just to kind of see that. Yeah. But this one specifically, I was like, man, you could definitely tell he HP Lovecraft read this story. That paragraph yeah. on perverseness, especially seems yeah. like <laughs> yeah. a very yeah. Lovecraftian kind of exploration of their psyche, why they're doing what they do. That one, and then the uh, the big one where it, the, it ends with them seeing the gallows on the cat, because mm-hmm. at the beginning of it, it's all about like how dread induces, what dread can do, and all this stuff, how it's affecting him, and it's you know it's that otherworldly that that thing you can't see and and gets into you, and it's kind of this outside force that's attacking you, that's kind of beyond. I mean, and that's kind of this whole story is somewhat him blaming an outside force. Um, I mean, he he talks about alcohol, but he never actually blames alcoholism on it. He just says it's like this. I mean, even at the beginning of stories, like it it wasn't it's not me. It was the spirits. It was the evil, evil ghosts or whatever that affected me and made these things happen. So temperance. Yes. It was the spirits in the bottle. That we're doing. Yeah, I, know. I was thinking that as soon as I said that, I was like, oh, spirits, bottle. It's the spirits uh, and the spirit. I mean, oh. this guy does not have much in the way of self-control. And on top oh. of that, his brain is pretty pickled. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that Lovecraft connection is really interesting because, I, I mean, when you look at the early Lovecraft stories, a lot of them are quite insular, too. Like, I, I, I think as soon as you mentioned the connection, I thought of the Lovecraft story, The Outsider, which, you know, is totally built on psychological interiority. And the the twist ending of that story is that the thing everyone is running away from and that is even terrifying to the protagonist is himself. Yeah. He, re- he reaches out at the end of the story and touches the mirror. So he realizes his reflection is what is so terrifying. Yeah. You know, that's that's straight Poe, you know? <laughs> yeah, definitely. I was even kind of thinking about the human chair and how that one was a letter being told and everything like that. And I think, I mean, and it's a neat concept. I like it because it's kind of you're, I mean, you are getting it secondhand and you're kind of getting it through the past, but it's fun to kind of enjoy that. And then again, like we said, it ties into a lot of the unreliableness of our letter writer yeah, and that, that convention of letters serving a big narrative function is, is kind of just typical of the Gothic in general. Like, I mean, you look at two of the biggest uh, Gothic novels, Frankenstein and Dracula, and a big yeah. portion of those narratives is comprised of letters, too. Mm-hmm. Now, I because there is a movie. I haven't seen it. Or if I have, it's been a long time with Vincent Price. Does it have any tie to this? 
there are a few adaptations. Not, <laughs> most of them are not very faithful. My my favorite, <laughs> it might be the least faithful, is a, a 1934 movie with uh, Bela Lugosi and Boris Karloff. It's it's so 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 good. I, I actually recently wrote a piece kind of arguing that there is some thematic connection, but the plots are totally dissimilar. The only <laughs> similarity is that the they both deal with the cat as like a, a symbol of a psychological uh, state. So in the poem in the uh, Lugosi and Karloff movie, the cat kind of represents the Lugosi character's trauma. It's very much like about um, post-war trauma. So good. That does sound good. I mean, Karloff and Lugosi, enough said, yeah, right? Exactly. Right. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, I was just trying to, because like I vaguely remember, because I mean, there was that period of time where Vincent Price was doing a lot of the Edgar Allan ones, and they were all. All those. Raw, who was the producer for those? Corman. Um, yeah. yeah, I thought it was Corman. I was like, all those Roger Corman and Allan Poe adaptations. And I remember them being like very loosely based. So I was just trying to think. I was like, I wonder how they would do this story. <laughs> well, that one's in an anthology called Tales of Terror, and it's actually one of the Corman Poe I haven't seen, but I've I, I'd like to actually watch that. Yeah, yeah, it'd be interesting. It would just be interesting now to kind of see them because, like, it seems sort of you know, I mean, it, it's all internal what's happening. I mean, you're, you're not going to watch somebody take a cat, an eye out of a cat, so. Just wondering how that all works, and, and it, it's an interesting, interesting idea. I think one of the more faithful adaptations is from Two Evil Eyes, which was a. Uh, have, have you guys seen that? It was Argento and Romero. No. Um, yeah, I think I think it was Argento who did the Black Cat segment, and it's it's pretty faithful, if I recall correctly. So it's good stuff. Yeah, it sounds good. Um, look, look out for that one. Yeah. No, this was a good I, – I enjoyed it. You know, I mean, like, you kind of got to look past a little bit of just the the writing. It took me a while to get into it, just the language choices and everything. I mean, works for its time and was and interesting, but it, it takes you a minute to kind of get into that mindset. But I, I enjoyed, like, the overall – everything. It, it, it's just such an interesting kind of story, and I, I think we've talked about it. But I can't imagine, like, at the time – how they took it, what the reception was for that story. I do know at the time, like Poe was more popular in Europe than he was in the States. Mm -hmm. Um, Especially in France. Yeah. in France and Italy, I think were the two countries he was really big in. And he wasn't actually very popular here in, in the States. We, we would appreciate Poe later, but when he was publishing, people weren't, weren't vibing with, with, uh, those pen knives to the eyes. <laughs> <laughs> it was Baudelaire who kind of gave him a name in France, I think. But apparently Baudelaire kind of created this misconception that the protagonists and Poe were all just basically Poe. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he struggled with addiction and gambling and things like that. But I don't I don't think there's evidence to suggest he was a homicidal maniac <laughs> yeah. that we know um, of that we know of. <laughs> He okay, kept sure. so many of his victims buried behind walls. They just haven't found yeah. them. <laughs> Another issue with Poe, too, is like when Poe died, the person who like wrote Poe's obituary and biography was someone who hated Poe. Oh, right. <laughs> so a lot of like the stuff we end up learning about Poe is written by a guy who hated his gut. So was trying to slender his name. <laughs> yes, that's true. So, like, there's a lot of stuff with Poe that leads to a lot of misconception. That makes sense. Yeah, no, that's a good point. His The circumstances surrounding his death are still uncertain, too. Like, no one knows exactly how he died. He was just – he was discovered wearing someone else's clothes, and he was yeah. fucked out of his mind. Um, <laughs> and uh, they, they don't know if it was, like, heart failure or maybe um, some kind of suicide or – which is – uh, very fitting for a character like Edgar Allan Poe. Po- Poe's a very mysterious person when it comes down to a lot of it, because even a lot of the circumstances surrounding his life that we know today is all based on misconception. Yes. Yeah. Which I think is fitting for someone like Poe. But it's also like it leads us to try to figure out, like, OK, what was what was really happening here? 
But I do think his, as I teach English as well, I think Poe's one of my favorite authors to teach because there's so much to dive into with his sentence construction, with mm-hmm. his tone, how he conveys the moods of his stories. There's a lot to dive into with like readers and students of like how Poe is a really great example of really moody, really well-written storytelling. Oh, I agree. Definitely. Yeah. And, and, you know, I think the the way Poe piles on the adjectives is actually very artful and uh, deliberate to, you know, and, and I think you're right that the use of atmosphere is that's another thing that I think connects Poe to Lovecraft even more so with Lovecraft. A lot of those stories are almost built entirely on atmosphere, which is something I, I love. Poe's yeah. fantastic at that. <laughs> Yeah, there, yeah, there's definitely a lot of atmosphere here. I mean, like you can see, he, I mean, you can see the bar, what that bar has got to be like, or even when he's sitting in the poor house that he, they're in and just a concept of this cat sitting on his lap or sitting on his face. I thought that was such like a, you could just like, he talks about like this cat would climb up him using his claws and everything like that. And you just, yeah, it's, it's very creepy. Ever yeah. since you mentioned earlier about the wife's point of view, I just keep thinking how badly now I want to have like Gwendolyn Keist or Sarah Tantlinger write that story. Right. Well, because, and that's, yeah, <laughs> it would kill the hell out of that narrative. Because I mean, like, <laughs> that's why I kept because it fits in that time. That was because it, it was the Gwendolyn Keist story that did the side of Dracula. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and that's what I kept thinking about for this one, especially because it she is so not like she's only mentioned like three or four times. Two of those are kind of the good times. And then two of those are just that she's one of the, she's suffering from his his torments. And even like besides that, it's like you could, you could get a really interesting story about watching this guy just spiral and how the spiraling comes out in you know killing of this cat and alcoholism and all of these things um you know it's it's it 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 would be a really interesting kind of look especially like even again going off of that i think it was the ann barker i think it's ann barker or harkin whatever the dracula one is um you could see like because that's got to be a society thing too because they were wealthy well off and then to go from that to the poorhouse would be an interesting kind of look, especially at that time. We don't know where this takes place. I mean, but you can imagine like some big city kind of thing. At least in my head, I did. I kind of pictured like a bigger city. You could see that would be a really interesting kind of look at not only dealing with an alcoholic husband, but dealing with, I'm assuming, the class of like, I'm slipping from all the people I used to hang out with to this group in this little poorhouse thing and she clearly gets out because all these people at least noticed that they had to have noticed that she was missing because why else would the cops be there so it i think that would be a really cool to see one of them do that story yeah there's a lot of potential to open up the exteriority of this story beyond the narrator's delusional perhaps point of view Mm -hmm. i agree and like the other thing, which is interesting, not to tie in with the wife side of it, but just this concept of like it's almost it, it's such like a picture of what we see. And we've talked about this in earlier podcasts, but about like what you normally see with a serial killer, which is starting out torturing and harming animals and then going into humans. It, that kind of when I was especially at the first parts when he's talking about like tearing the cat's eye out and then hanging the cat which then ties into the law part of like him knowing this this is wrong but he just he does it because he knows it's wrong. It's such like framed into that kind of story of a serial killer. Now he's older. Normally you kind of see these starting out as like the younger person younger male usually killing of animals and then going up from there. But you still have that blueprint here. Uh, just so happens that he gets caught um, after killing the first human. I would suspect that there is a history of animal abuse for him. I don't think you just get drunk one day and cut out a cat's eyes for shits and giggles. Well, I, I Mike, was wondering. It depends what you're drinking. 
<laughs> well, and I was wondering that too because in the story, I mean, he makes it sound like he loves all these animals at the start. So, like, I just can't. I didn't. I didn't see him as that. Now I saw him as a lonely because the way they described it, or he described himself as he couldn't. He didn't know how to get along with other children, and that's how he hung out with these animals and and loved his dog specifically. He talked a lot about that. Well, he didn't so get I, along with those kids because he was putting firecrackers on their pets' tails. <laughs> <laughs> so the, he, was, he was fond of their hamsters and a playing doctor with them. Yeah, like <laughs> putting M80s up then? a gerbil's ass, and they just don't <laughs> like him anymore. He's not allowed at the house. He had a little hideout in his root cellar that had a bunch of animal carcasses on the walls. <laughs> Fair. Um, but so like I just that's I, that's where I kind of like w- was going with this story for a little bit, too, was just that that blueprint of of a serial killer. And and I couldn't help but think of I mean, H.H. H. Holmes was probably right around was I think was right around this time. And and so just that concept of what he was doing and then this story. So it, it's just it's an there's a lot that you could really unpack with this one. Even I mean, it out- also plays a lot into the superstition surrounding black cats. Yes. Mm-hmm. But he loved his black cat, apparently. Wasn't yeah. afraid of it. Well, well and that, that, he also thought it might have been a witch in disguise. Yeah, <laughs> I, mean, I was going to say, that's, <laughs> and that, like, that, again, talking about the unreliableness of this narrator, is he, um, he introduces that concept of, oh, well, the black cat, you know, is, is a witch in disguise, and then that's when I think like right after that is when he discusses like, oh, well, the fiendish temperaments took over. And that's when I started hating all of these things. And you couldn't help. I mean, like quickly he talks about it. And I think he even talked about the beginning of this, but you can't help but think at first like, oh, it is the black cat's magic powers making him hate everybody and hate all animals. So. Yeah, there's a lot like even beyond what is told here that could be explored and looked at. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think you're uh, doing a good job of kind of detailing the way (laughs) this story um, plays with that concept of the unreliable narrator where the uh, objective events uh, begin and the subjective interpretation begins. It's really prickly. Yeah, definitely. So, yeah, I I, the more I talk about, the more I enjoy it. Yeah, thank you for picking the story, Mike. It's actually a post story I haven't visited in a while, and I'm happy I did. Awesome. Glad you glad you guys had fun with it. it it's a bundle of fun, this story. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I liked it quite a lot. There's definitely a lot of room for interpretation. Yeah, and I'll I'll do the monkey story. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> and it's also it's like on this podcast we talk a lot about like newer horror stories but we we like to kind of go all over the spectrum because our goal is just to have a discussion with the horror genre but this is actually the first time we've discussed poe oh yeah. cool uh, yeah i think you mentioned to me in uh in our messages that you hadn't done poe yet so i was I very hyped before. so this was this was our poe cherry being bu- busted <laughs> <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> Oh man, yeah, I was thinking that too. I was like, oh, it's kind of neat that we're 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 digging back. We haven't discussed him yet, and I think that's a neat that we can kind of go deeper into the past. Yeah. I'm I'm so su- actually no, never mind. I was gonna say I'm surprised we went this so far without doing a Stephen King story, but we did do one. So yes, yeah, we did do one. We did do one. <laughs> <laughs> but there, Which there's there's King a story lot. Did you do? Uh, Children of the Corn. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Yeah, it was a fun one. It was. Speaking of which, I finally got Night Shift after like waiting three fucking years for that book. Finally! <laughs> Thank you, Richard Classic. Chismar. It took a long time to put that together, but it came out really nice. Yeah, I'm hoping it doesn't take another three years for The Stand to oh my gosh. get produced. But you know what? It's it's a great quality book. I, I got my copy of Night Shift also, and it's beautiful. <laughs> so I'm very happy with it, even if it does take an excessive amount of time. That was a long wait. It was. I I, I ordered that book when I was still living in China. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you so much for taking some time and come on the podcast, Mike. Thank you so much for having me, guys. It was a lot of fun. I really appreciate it. And uh, where can listeners get in touch with you? Um, my website is MikeThornWrites.com. Um, there's a contact 
form on there. You can also connect with me on Twitter at Mike Thorne Writes. That's my Instagram handle too. And I'm on Goodreads and Facebook. So I'm all over this uh, this place we call the internet. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. And Matt, what about you? I am on Twitter at Brandenburg DM. And Mike? Uh, you can look me up on Twitter at Mike H5856 or hit up my website at michaelpatrickhicks.com. And you can follow me at Rudy53088, as well as be sure to follow our Twitter for the podcast at Into Staring. We want to make sure that you leave a review on the different platforms we're available on. We're streaming on all podcast platforms. So be sure just to give us a little review, help us on the algorithm, and make sure the abyss consumes all. And this is Richard Gerlach saying, keep staring. Hi, I'm John Baldisberger, host of Madness Heart Radio. Join me each week as I discuss writing, living, life, and horror with some of the coolest people in the industry. Talk to writers, directors, actors, and really anyone at all that's involved in scaring people's pants off. Can't wait for you to join us, but until then, stay safe but stay scared. This has been a presentation of the Project Entertainment Network.